So, um, Inigo, I think uh, you can start. I mean, uh, the floor is yours. And thanks again for your uh, availability. Thanks, Simone. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Good morning. So, I'm going to start uh, this uh, today today's session doing a presentation, a theoretical presentation about the uh, baseline and policy scenarios, and in general, how to run a scenario with a um, type of model such as uh, William. Okay, so um, I'm going to focus mainly on three on three topics. I hope you see my screen. Sorry, I didn't ask just for checking. Yes, okay. So I'm going to talk three about three main topics. Um, in general, what is the scenario methodology applied to integrated assessment models? Then I would like also to talk a bit about the usefulness and limits of uh, integrated assessment models uh, or, or models in general, because I think this is uh, something important because models can be very easily misused. No, You press the button, you simulate, you get some numbers. No, So it's important that we know what type of tool we have and what can be done and what cannot be done. Uh, of course, this we, we should say for each model in particular, but here I'm going to focus a bit in general about model, quantitative modeling. And the last thing I want to cover today is uh, what is the framework for simulating scenarios that we have set up specifically for, for William. Okay, so for those who attended the first session of the MOOC, um, when I presented a bit the motivation to develop the model, so I started explaining you know, that uh, we have we are in a context of global sustainability and social crisis. Uh, this is not new for almost anybody, but it's very important to highlight and have always in the background. So we have a problem uh, of uh, environmental sustainability where we have surpassed uh, six out of, out of nine planetary boundaries, uh, even if climate change is the most relevant or the most the most relevant, I would say, the most popular, there are others that are also very relevant that are less, let's say, popular. And we should take care uh, when we solve one of these not to create problems in, in the others. Uh, the paradox is that even if we are uh, creating uh, very high pressures in the environment, we are not even able to cover the basic human needs for all population. So the, the challenge we have is with the resources we have, knowing that on the one hand we have fossil fuel resources, which are uh, finite and non-recyclable, and then we have minerals, which are also finite but re recyclable, and uh, potentials of renewables, which are constrained by different uh, limitations, we should be able to, to see how we could do in the future. Okay, so because sustainability is multidimensional, then comes the, the need of or the, the usefulness of using integrated assessment uh, models. I'm not going to explain this because I already covered in the first day, but basically it's important to have in mind this integration between subsystems, uh, both in the human and natural earth uh, systems. And then what is it to apply an uh, integrated assessment model? But basically, if we overlap this uh, framework of planetary boundaries with uh, basic human needs, no, we get this uh, donut which has become now famous, the concept of donut economics, in which we are looking for pathways which do not trespass the ecological ceiling, but are able to at least cover basic human needs for everybody. No? So conceptually, to run a, such a type of model will be to try to find pathways which are here in the door, in the door of the of the donut. Okay, so why are quantitative dynamic simulation models useful? I think this is important to have in mind um, because of course theory is the foundation of any scientific work, but the theory has some limits which quantitative dynamic analysis can help uh, to overcome. So I'm going to list uh, the ones that for me are more relevant. So the first thing is that, what is it a model, no? 
Uh, for me, a model is what I call a consistency machine in the sense that you have a lot of constraints that try to represent an equation that try to represent your system. And then you run everything and, and then you get uh, results which will be totally impossible to get just with what it is called a mental model, no? with your imagination or your knowledge. So the problems of using mental models are very well known because it has been shown that in general, mental models tend to be static, uh, narrow in time, space and interconnections. And of course, maybe bias by wrong information, ignorance, vested interest, perception, biases. So this doesn't mean that models cannot be biased by these things, but in theory, it should be more easy to try to, to track these things, or at least uh, from with transparency. And then also in the mental models, of course, a lot of assumptions are just not explicit. Another advantage of quantitative uh, methods in general and dynamic uh, simulation in particular is that it allows to compare magnitudes. Um, this is very relevant uh, because it allows to identify leverage points uh, assessing or comparing the efficacy of different policy measures. So from a theoretical point of view, you can have an idea that two policies can go in the same direction, but until you don't do some quantification, it's difficult to know which one is more, uh, which one makes more impact. And then another useful thing of comparing magnitudes is that we can work with uncertainties. So if we are able to know uh, which are the input uncertainties of some uh, uncertainties of some inputs, then we can perform systematic uncertainty and sensitivity analysis to try to understand uh, better our system and the potential impacts and, and risks. Well, yes, as I already mentioned, no, it allows to better understand the system that we are studying. No? So in modeling, there is one uh, famous, let's say, or known, well-known um, characteristic, which is when you run a complex model, no, very often you get surprise behavior in the sense that you get some results that uh, are counterintuitive to your intuition or previous knowledge. And, and sometimes, your, I mean, the model makes you learn new things. No? This is not possible to know with only theoretical analysis. Well, another important thing, uh, we are talking about sustainability, about transition. Uh, transition, it is an inherently dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, process. Okay, and well, at the end of the day, also quantification allows to get much more precise depending on the topic you want to analyze. For example, if you want to do policy advice, in general, policymakers, they want precise things. They don't want general ideas because for them, this is too far from implementation. So, okay. Also, I would like to talk a bit about model typologies because of course the different types of models are different for, for different purposes. You cannot use one model for everything or whatever. So, I want to show you this figure uh, in which uh, I try to uh, represent uh, different models. So the, the representation of the, each model is, uh, is subjective, let's say, but the general idea is that we can classify models according to two characteristics. One, it is uh, in the horizontal axis, the aggregation level. So uh, from highly aggregated models with little amount of dimensions and uh, um, dimensions represented also to very high resolution models with a lot of technologies, a lot of sectors, a lot of land use types, etc. And then in terms of level of integration in the vertical axis means all these systems that are represented, how many feedbacks or uh, links they have between them. Okay. So when you look to the literature in general, you see that most uh, models are following this um, decreasing uh, red uh, line. Why? Because of course it's, very, it's easier to integrate modules with a small aggregation 
than to link modules that uh, are much more uh, aggregated. Also, the size of the model increases a lot, the computational time, etc. So, why I'm saying this? Because, of course, uh, everything that goes from the line to the, let's say, to beyond external, uh, this uh, blue arrow where it is written more difficult or more realistic, well, yes, you need much more work, it's much more difficult, you need to do much more connections, but your result is expected to be much more realistic and much more useful for policy advice. However, everything that goes to low integration, uh, highly aggregated models is much more easier to model and also, of course, less, less realistic. Well, this is about um, a bit of theory. And now I would like to, to start a bit with the part of scenarios. Um, and the first comment maybe is obvious for most of you, but it's very important. Uh, a model alone does not produce any result. You need to run, uh, some, you need to pro in, uh, include some inputs to get some, some outputs, no? Why I'm saying this? Because, well, many times I, I say that the models are, many times uh, can be easily misused. And also many people outside, let's say, of the modeling, let's say, field, uh, also they don't understand or sometimes they don't want to understand what it is a model, no? And here, for example, I, I put this uh, picture of this book, no? Uh, a critic of the limits to growth, which I imagine most of you know. Uh, the, uh, and then it's written models of doom, no? So. It's very interesting this because for those of you who are familiar with the limits to growth, you should know or you know that there was at least one or two scenarios in which there was not a collapse. This is the, for example, I copy in, on the right a screenshot from results from the original work for the scenario of a stabilized world model. No, so this. In particular, this model, depending on the inputs, produce in some cases collapse scenarios and in other cases stabilized stationary state or sustainable scenarios. No? So this title of models of doom is totally totally wrong. No? Well, this is a historical anecdote, but I think it's interesting. Okay. So of course we could classify the models in very different categories. Uh, here I would like to distinguish between policy simulation and policy optimization, uh, because this is a relevant um, the relevant thing when you want to run a William, which is a policy simulation model. I recall. So basically, in a policy simulation model, it's easy the procedure. You modify the inputs you obtain some outputs and that's it. In optimization models, the simulation is a bit more complex because uh, even if we have the same structure of inputs entering into the system and producing outputs, inside the system, there is one, uh, one mechanic, a built-in mechanic to optimize one or more variables, which for example, can be the maximization of utility uh, function, it's utility function, not utility cost function, sorry, written um, or minimize the costs. And then the rest of the system behaves conditional on that. So here it is very important to take into account that uh, you cannot optimize everything. I mean, uh, you need to know, um, I mean, you can optimize or optimization is valid when the system is very well known and we can control and precisely measure all the inputs and outputs. So it's not the same to do optimization with a machine for an industry or for an integrated assessment model of the world. No? So you must, you, you, it's clear that uh, the system is not perfectly well known and we cannot control perfectly everything. So we think that optimization in this uh, context is not a good idea. Okay. So... When we work with the uh, integrated assessment models, uh, it's very typical to work with the scenario methodology. No, so uh, for me, scenario methodology could be summarized in these points. Um, basically, it's a method uh, to deal with uh, a lot of uncertainties and, and limitations of quantitative uh, modeling. So, 
first thing you need to know is that one EM of the size of William can have dozens or hundreds of policies. So when you want to parameterize a scenario across all modules of the model in a consistent way, this is not straightforward. So it's important to have a, a scheme to modify all of them in a consistent way. And this consistency is achieved starting by, by the definition of a storyline. No? So any model has exogenous inputs, of course. And then the idea is that this you, you configure these exogenous inputs coherently with a storyline of how the future might evolve. So, and this is totally independent of our individual preferences. Of course, all of us have some biases or subjectivities and we would prefer some future or the other, but uh, with the, the model allows you to test these different potentially interesting or relevant or possible futures in a consistent way. Then another characteristic is that, of course, I'm sure each of us could come up with a different storyline, but we, can, we cannot work with, uh, I don't know, hundreds of storylines in an EAM because then uh, the, the, you need to analyze all that. So it's, it's a bit, uh, it's too, it will be too complex. So one strategy is to try to work with limited number of storylines um, for, for simplicity and for also communication purposes. So of course, with this strategy, there is a trade-off between comprehensiveness uh, of the of, co of the, the analysis and workability of the scenario architecture. No, because we are with policy simulation model, we work with a what-if approach. We are testing assumptions. In principle, we do not have to decide on the likelihood of testing something. Of course, it should make sense, but the idea is to test the consequences if that something will happen or will be in implemented. And finally, and this is also very important, uh, scenario methodology is comparative analysis. Um, the value added of the model is the comparison of the different results when we change the inputs. So here we should very clearly distinguish between projections which is what we do with models, projections from predictions. So when we are talking here about EAMs and the evolution of war in many different dimensions, it's impossible to predict. There will be always things uh, not considered, and I will talk a bit uh, later about this. But uh, the value added is, okay, if, I, if the trends are like this and I do this and that, what will happen if I consider that my system is well represented? And the last point is that I already mentioned before, but it's possible and relatively easy to analyze parametric and structural uncertainty. So basically in scenario methodology, we have two types of storylines. We have one baseline, which is basically the reference for this comparative analysis. Um, typically is a continuation of current trends or this built uh, with this logic. So, for example, if you have some parameter, uh, then you estimate this parameter from past trends, and then you just maintain this parameter in the projection. So you say, okay, I'm, this parameter is capturing current trends, and I, I, I project it. But we have to be totally aware that uh, the same that uh, each of us could think about a lot of different storylines for the future, different people we can have different understanding of what is what are current trends because in current trends is also is not obvious many times no when you have for example a break in historical trend what do you take uh, before the break the average after the break only the, this trend is has been broken um for always or it has been broken um, just because of an event which will disappear. So uh, it's that's the reason also that many times it's useful to have more than one uh, baseline. But the, the, but the important thing of this baseline is that in any case, they should be able to reproduce the problems that we aim to find solutions. No? So if you want to, to, I don't know, you have a, a model oriented to climate change and your model, the temperature does not increase, 
too much, but you have a problem with your model, of course, or with your scenario. And then uh, the other main type of storyline is the policy action scenario, where basically on top of the baseline scenario, uh, we include a series of political measures uh, in order to try to solve the, these problems that we detected in the baseline. Okay, so how to put all these pieces uh, together? Uh, so the starting point, of course, is the model. We have one model, which is built uh, following a lot of hypotheses, and we could test the validity of this uh, uh, or the uncertainty of this stru structural hypothesis. And then, okay, we we the, select as uh, the storylines I just mentioned. No baseline. We start with baseline. The storyline is just a story. It's a qualitative uh, information. We need to quantify, we need to translate this qualitative information into numbers, uh, into numbers uh, that are inputs of the model. Okay? So once we do that, we run the model. Yes, we have the two types of scenarios. We obtain some results and then we check if the goals that we had uh, in mind have been reached or not. Of course, if the goals have not been reached, and very typically in the first time you don't reach them in a, such a complex model such as William or others, but then you need to iterate and you need to maybe revise your... Well, the order is you first revise the, the strength of your policies, no? So maybe your policies were not enough uh, strong, so you need to be a bit more rough, let's say, or more faster or, or, or bigger magnitude, whatever. If imagine you put the policies, policies of your story at maximum level and still you don't reach your goals. Well, this is an extreme case, but it can happen. Then this means that your storyline is not is not valid, and you need to revise the, the storyline. Mm, okay, this procedure, this iterative procedure, uh, of course, could be automatized, and then we could work when we have done some tests in the project with simulation-based optimization. So, in this concept, basically, we through a program. Uh, optimization program, we try to find in an automatic way which are the value of the policies which maximize a goal function if you have several goals. This is very different. This is totally different from a policy, uh, policy sorry, um, optimization model. Eh? The optimization model has the optimization procedure here inside of the model, inside of the EAM. Okay. So here you can see the three main elements of scenarios no? uh, in bold. You have policies, you have storylines, you have hypotheses, and you have goals. So in EAMs, the goals uh, generally are general objectives of social level. So you can think about reduction of temperature or unemployment or share of renewables, I don't know, things like this. Very aggregated general uh, goals. Okay, so I was using until now the, the word policies, no? So for those of you who are familiar with this type, this field, no? Policies is a very, very general word. And in fact, when we started the project, we realized that very different people have had a different understanding of this concept. So one of the first steps was to uh, try to, because in the literature, there is no standard. So to try to have at least an agreement uh, at the level of the project to standardize these concepts. So basically, well, policies for us is a general uh, intervention in the system, but then we can distinguish between policy measures, policy objectives, and policy targets. So basically, and we have the three of them in the model, depending on the system, depending on the policy, depending on how it has been modeled. For example, policy objective is a generally formulated the desired outcome of a policy, which will not be confounded with policy targets. Policy targets are more uh, refer more to a quantified level or rate set for the chosen objective. And a policy measure is 
uh, very concrete is an intervention in a part of the existing system. Okay, so later I will show you how this is, is also documented in the in the in the model. Okay. Ah, well, and then we can combine things, for example. So this is a paper in which they combine scenario analysis with uncertainty analysis, no? So each, uh, I forgot to put the legend, but each line, I think, corresponds to a, to emissions scenario uh, interpreted by image model. So you have in solid line the central, the central value of the distribution. And then you have in the shadow areas all the uncertainty spread of each uh, of each uh, of each uh, scenario. This is also something very interesting. Okay, so I I mentioned no, that it's important to know the limitations of uh, of each model. No, so in of course each model has its own limitations because it depends on the dimensions cover which linkages or not are included. Um, and then of course there are some limitations which are intrinsic or inherent to quantitative uh, modeling. And this is related with everything related with uncertainties and ignorance about future, uh, especially with relation, for example, to the social dimension, the state and evolution of institutional framework, cultural norms, the degree of democracy and freedom, conflicts of interest, social complexity, diverse information and motivations, etc. So all these things are very difficult, if not impossible to model, at least in EAMs such as William, uh, they are not considered and we should be aware of, of this. So social dimension is uncertain and then we have deep uncertainties uh, to detect these uh, social tipping points or also to forecast, typically this more in technological models, to forecast future technological change. No, it is usually assumed that all the time we'll have this technological change, but we know that this has not to be always the case. And then also we have to be aware that the model has been built by people. When, so people have modelers have taken decisions and they are affected by their own subjectivities and, and everything. Okay, so what is at the end of the day useful, William or I am in general, or should be useful, no? Uh, so IAMs are useful tools to analyze <clears throat> where current trends mainly does and the effectiveness of different strategies. Strategies as a synonymous of scenario and specific policies to address issues and reach overall sustainability and social goals. And in my understanding, the usage of EAMs, uh, I mean, it, it's a tool for planning, but um, which should be all the time improved with new knowledge or with better data, and then in an iteration process with let's say reality and stakeholders to 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 refine uh, its structure, data, and and results at the end. Okay, so maybe this I will keep. Well, in general, in the literature, scenarios for EAMs. Um, there are many sets of scenarios in the in the literature. Um, in principle, um, they, they were used for the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, for example, related with biodiversity. But it is true that the most um, the most relevant and the most important scenarios for climate for for EAMs have been developed uh, within the IPCC for climate change no due to this preponderance of climate change as environmental problem in the in the agenda so well i don't want to enter here into details but there are different reports of scenarios um, they have been changing a bit the methodology so this is the first set well, no, not the first, sorry. This is the third set of scenarios from the year 2000, the special report on emission scenarios, which we became, they became very famous, very popular. And then the, the update of this scheme was the, uh, uh, the um, SSPs, the Shared Socioeconomic uh, Pathways, in which instead of four, there were five scenarios. Uh, well, here there are some discussion. Some of them are baseline, others not. 
but I don't want to enter here into too many details. For me here, one important thing to say, I already said in the first uh, session of the MOOC, is that we should always have in mind the IPCC uh, is an intergovernmental body to work in us with scientists. So it's not uh, fully independent. And this uh, explains some of the decisions, not only for models, but also for the set of scenarios. Because at the end also they are couple or dependent one on, on the other. So for William, um, we could not use or apply directly the IPCC scheme, no, based the current scheme, because this is going to change, based on relative concentration pathways, shared socioeconomic pathways, and the shared policy assumption for these four main reasons. No, First re reason, very important, and for those of you who were in previous sessions about the economy and the um, demography module. So uh, in William, GDP per capita uh, is endogenous. Here, uh, well, we have a problem. I mean, I have an error here because population is, is exogenous in the current version, but GDP per capita is endogenous. And also in William, we have more overall goals which go beyond the climate change targets. And then also the SSPs, by definition, exclude the climate change impacts and none of them could be considered a post-growth scenario. So these are the main reasons that we needed to... Uh, we didn't develop from scratch a new methodology. We, we used, uh, of course, some of the IPCC elements, uh, also because in, it's useful for comparison with other works, but we needed to adapt. So how we did this procedure of adaptation. So first, what we, we started by a literature review uh, of the scenario elements. Um, we cover which are the relevant storylines out there in the literature or by, by stakeholders, by civil society. Also relevant policy measures and targets. And then we did a match this a matching of these scenarios and policies because not all of us and all of the scenarios are consistent with all scenarios. Sorry, not all the policies are consistent with all the scenarios. We also did a literature review of indicators of for sustainability goals and environmental threshold. And then we also uh, did about the uh, regionalization. So here we had a loop uh, interaction with the stakeholders to improve this. Um, and then we at the end, we needed to cross check with modelers because of course, uh, from literature review, you obtain a lot of storylines, a lot of policies, a lot of information, but then we have to see what is feasible in the scope of the project to include in the model, no, in a realistic way. So as a result of this process, we came up with uh, four storylines uh, one baseline and three policy uh, scenarios. Uh, we came out with, uh, well, in the literature review, we cover very, a lot of policies, 1,500 we had in the database. Then uh, 20 indicators of overall goals. Uh, well, the hypothesis is the construction of the model. And then we have 15 regionalization scenarios and the, the matching of policies and scenarios. So after cross-checking with stakeholders and models and so on, what it is now available in the model? So we have the narratives defined, but we have only achieved the parametrization of this for the energy module. So we are working in the other modules. In terms of policies, we have around 60 already working in the model. Um, of course, 60 looks very small compared to 1,500, but here I should explain a bit this number. First number is that, of course, uh, some policies in our model cover many policies in the literature review because of this pyramid I show you of policy measures, targets, and objectives. No? With, with, you can have a general policy that in the literature maybe are 10 or 20. Uh, and the other thing is that for an integrated assessment model, 60 policies is not bad at all when you see what uh, is available. 
Um, then in terms of indicators overall goals, we have we have done quite well. Uh, of course, we could not include indicators of overall goals of uh, dimensions not represented in the model. For example, in the model, we don't have uh, a module of biodiversity. So all this uh, dimension is not, uh, we cannot have indicators of this. Uh, and then for the implementation of regionalization scenarios and punching of policies and scenarios, we, we need to work on it. Okay, so I mentioned that we selected uh, four storylines, one baseline and three alternatives. So we have a lot of discussions about this, but at the end we decided to have a baseline which looks like SSP2 from the uh, IPCC set, but without being constrained by it uh, in some regions where it doesn't make sense, for example, for European Union, uh, the SSP2 we think is not very accurate. But I'm basically having this idea of extrapolation of, of current trends. And then we selected three storylines. First one is green growth. Uh, green growth, I think, is well known by everybody because it's the main uh, institutional response to the sustainability crisis, crisis which is based uh, on market tools and technological development. And here I have some keywords no, that, that give you a sense of what this scenario represents, which is based on economic growth with absolute decoupling, global economic convergence, fast diffusion of low carbon technologies, sector coupling for dealing with variability of renewables and efficiency improvements. Well, uh, while the project uh, was running, uh, there was this uh, new policies from the European Union uh, launching this Green Deal, no? So we felt uh, we needed also to take into account um, these new uh, ideas or change in policy uh, under this name of Green Deal that for us, our interpretation is that it is a green growth complemented with social policies. So it has the, all the features of green growth but focusing on social inequality reduction. And we could think about keywords such as public investment, welfare state, public ownership of energy utilities, not all of them, but some, job warranty, public intervention. And then the third uh, storyline that uh, we selected from the last relevant uh, storyline is the post-growth one which is basically based on voluntarily downscaling and socioeconomic restructuration. And the key words that this, this depicted will be relocalization, sharing economy, self-organization, commons, conviviality, voluntary behavioral change, sufficiency, be reducing material throughput, etc. So of course we are aware that these are archetypes. So inside each storyline, we will have a diverse, uh, the, the diverse interpretations or sub uh, scenarios, but at the level of the project, um, we thought uh, it, that would be enough uh, uh, for the time being. Okay, and then we did the matching of scenarios and policies. No, so this is something that we still have to do, but basically, so to to give you a more specific idea of what it is, for example, we, we have here the four scenarios. The four storylines, we have uh, in each line a policy, and then through literature review, we uh, identify if it is a policy present in that scenario or not, and the strength, no, the, the, the level. So, for example, investment in renewables is important in all scenarios, but it is more important in the policies, in the policies, uh, policy action scenarios. Uh, if we talk, for example, about basic income, but this is a policy that is only mentioned in post-growth or mainly in post-growth literature. So it doesn't make sense to, to test it in the other scenarios. So you go like this one by one, and then you transform this input table, qualitative input table into numbers, quantitative input table. And then in terms of regionalization, uh, well, we, we were thinking which, of course, there are... Uh, infinite number of combinations, but we thought 
uh, which we selected, which would be more interesting. I don't want to enter here into details or a question of time. Okay, so my last point will be to show you the scenario parameters file of, um, of the model. So I'm going to, uh, okay, so this is, I, I know that in other sessions of the MOOC, uh, for example, Lucas Egler, who showed the results from the energy module, showed you with some detail, no, how to change the policies for, for producing the results in the energy module. So I don't want to too much to go into detail of this, but I just wanted to give you to finish an overview of this, um, of this Estel, which is the main tool. Uh, to run a scenario uh, with William. So first thing is that this is all still a, a working, uh, is a working uh, document. So you will see it's not uh, still in, it's not pretty and clean, but uh, we are close. Okay, so first tab is a readme, basically uh, where you can see uh, each uh, tab because there are different tabs which structure the information, uh, which is included in each tab. So if we have first three tabs in which we have a qualitative information here, for example, we have the glossary and narratives, which I mentioned, no, the, the, the definitions that we agreed in the project. And this is how we use these terms in the model. Here we have a more extended definition of the, of the storylines, because what I mentioned to you was of course very short. Then we have like a, 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 an index of all the policies in all modules. Let me zoom in. Okay, so this looks like this. Um, we have the name of the policy. We have an hyperlink to where this policy, for example, this is a policy about afforestation in this line, in the line 43, afforestation policy. This belongs to the module of land and water. And if you go to Benzim, you will find it in this view, land, land demands. And here we have a description of what it, this policy in which it consists, uh, which are the parameters which um, uh, configure it. Well, and here we have some internal information about who is the model, but this is not uh, relevant for you. It's more for model development coordination. So. Okay, here you can have an idea of all the policies that we have. And if, for example, you want to change this afforestation policy, you click in the hyperlink and it brings you here to this panel. And here you have, okay, this policy is defined for these nine regions. Uh, with this switch, you activate or deactivate. Now, it, by default, all policies are deactivated, but if you put here one, you will activate for all these regions, this policy, here, for example, you want to start in 2030 and finish in 2050. And here, objective afforestation, I think it is a rate with relation to current forest, but I'm not sure any way it should be described here in the in the box because this is not, I should have chosen, picked a policy which I know better. I, I This one, I'm not sure. Okay. Not important. And then we have here one tab for each module. So when you want to configure the policies and hypotheses uh, of each uh, of the of the whole model, we have uh, separated by modules. And then you can set the numbers here by mo module by module. And here, well, we have some auxiliary aux auxiliary data. In this list here, important of policies, uh, it's also the name is policies and hypothesis. And this is because here we have a hypothesis. Now I realize I didn't define a hypothesis. Uh, what is the, dif the difference for us? Uh, a policy is everything that in principle could be controlled by humans. So for example, if a society or a country wants to promote renewables or electric car, or, or mm, people want to change the, the diets or whatever, this is something that in principle is a decision that we can take. Of course, later there can be biophysical constraints or macroeconomic constraints which allow you or not. And then is what we call an adaptative scenario. But to distinguish this, uh, which depends on our will from information that uh, the model is very sensitive to it and there is a lot of uncertainties. For example, 
here we have uh, climate sensitivity. So I don't know if you are familiar with climate sensitivity. Uh, how much the earth warms for the same level of emissions. So this is a parameter which in climatology there is a lot of uncertainty. And if there is somebody that wants to test different uncertainty of this, we do, you can do it. Uh, how much oil, gas, coal, fossil fuels are below the ground? Uh, this is also subject to uncertainty, you know, depending on who you ask, on who reports, how transparent it is. There is a lot of problems with uh, oil, in particular uh, resource estimates. So if you have information that there is more oil or less oil than what we have built in, in our model, it is available to... It is uh, here very easy. Well, this is broken. A ver. It's easy to change. Here, so fossil resource estimation. Here we have inbuilt three levels, low, medium, and high, which is based on literature review. So they are, let's say, reliable. But if you want to put your own number, then we have here an option for user selection, and then you put your number. OK. So I guess this is from my side what I wanted to talk to you. Well, some conclusions, uh, general conclusion, not the baseline. Uh, baseline uh, is the reference, but it's difficult to represent current trends. And also we have seen the strong impact of recent totally unexpected events, no? COVID, Ukraine, et cetera, war. Uh, also, it's, this is also a general comment, it's difficult to apply the standard scenario methodology when you have a model with so many interlinkages, because many dynamics are endogenous, so maybe uh, the initial storyline that you had in mind, the, the model is not able to represent exactly that. So in this sense, the model can provide surprise behavior or can provide interesting information about the feasibility or the viability of uh, scenarios and storylines. And then also, of course, this is very difficult, the, the regionalization of scenarios. There are many possibilities. And here, the job is to try to select which are relevant, uh, relevant futures and test them. Um, yes, and my last point uh, makes the bridge with the next presentation because um, it's important that these models are complex to try to develop tools to help uh, that the model is uh, used by non-experts. Okay, so I'm done. For Thank you for your attention. And now if you have questions. Thanks a lot, Inigo. It was uh, really clear. So I hope that there is some questions or curiosity. Okay, Timo, please. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Fantastic. Um, you talked a bit about the difference between um, this William model system dynamics and the optimization models. And I was interested to hear um, if there's been any debate uh, with with uh, kind of conventional economists, economists who use the optimization models and uh, what kind of uh, interaction have you had? Uh, what kind of discussions? And if, um, if you've had to kind of explain why you are doing this approach or or has there been like um, a positive response? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I guess it's a question you should have asked, uh, I don't know if you asked uh, the developer of the economic module. I, I was not in the full session. Um, what I can say is that uh, we have presented this model in some fora, scientific fora, but it's true that we have presented in fora which are open to, let's say, heterodox views. We have presented this in ecological economics conference in by the way, in PISA, we have presented it in other places. I don't remember now. So in general, the public, I say the target public uh, was open to it. So I, I cannot answer you more about this than this. OK, any any other comment or questions? Uh, thank you, Inigo. Um, 
At one point in the presentation, you talk about uh, in introducing combining scenario and uncertainty analysis. And I was quite curious about uh, how, to, uh, how you guys uh, approach this and to understand a bit better uh, how you incorporate uncertainty analysis for, in, in your scenario modeling. Uh, so, within each scenario, I would say, because you have a different, there is sensibility analysis, but you're talking about uncertainty analysis. And uh, uh, I was wondering a bit uh, more about this in specific. But sorry, uh, for clarification, the question is about the general method or more how we could do it for William? Uh, how you could do for William and uh, uh, yes. Okay. Okay. So basically, um, I mean, the scenario methodology is a, um, is a deterministic approach, no? In, in this Excel I showed you, uh, you put one number for each uh, option and then you run and you get one number, no? So if you want to do uncertainty analysis, uh, well, the, the starting point is to, to know the uncertainty distribution of your inputs. Uh, you don't need to have distributions for all your inputs. You need to have distributions for the ones that you think are relevant or the ones that you think there is more uncertainty. So this this uncertainty, this distribution can come in different ways. No, If you can have some, di uh, some distribution with some uh, empirical cumulative uh, data, or you can have a function, or you can have no idea, just the minimum and maximum. No, so in this sense, uh, Benzin, for example, is very well prepared to do uncertainty analysis, and you can define distributions in very dif in different ways for each input. So the typical ways to do a Monte Carlo analysis, you and you can run. We have done, by the way, in, for one deliverable uh, uncertainty analysis. Uh, I think we were using. Um, 200 simulations uh, and then you, I mean, you put everything in the model and you get the results. I don't know if this answered your, your question. Uh, there is uh, maybe one question on the chat. Oh, another question, this is okay. Uh, Inigo, could you read the, the chat? The one that yes, I Yes, and I can read. Um, so there is one person asking, what basis do you create the storylines? Uh, do you work with futurist prospectives? Do you take into account likelihood or credibility when creating storylines? It's a very good question. Um, well, in, in this project, the approach was to do literature review um, to see what is relevant. And in the consortia, we had mm, working group about this, uh, try to select the, the, the most relevant, and then we check course check with stakeholders. So we did not work, let's say, with uh, experts in the scenarios to try to develop uh, ex uh, ad hoc scenarios for the project, but just to try to see what was out there. And then do you take into account likelihood or credibility? Mm, likelihood or credibility? Mm, I think no, it's what I try to explain with the scenario methodology. For example, if we compare green growth with post growth, and, uh, most people will tell you that uh, post growth is very unlikely and not credible, no? But this does not mean that it's not interesting to analyze uh, what will happen if you simulate that, no? So this is the usefulness of EAMs that you can compare these different options, because well, I maybe I think this I cover more in the first day, but. The thing is that when we run our models, Medeas and William, when we no, we will run, we will see what we get. But with Medeas, we saw that there were many uh, problems in green growth scenario. So it makes a lot of sense to analyze other scenarios, even if are considered unlikely or not credible by people. Uh, I don't know if this answers your question. If not, you tell me. And then you have another question, the same person. Recently, some integrated agent-based and uh, system dynamic models have been developed. Do you see a future of PMs involving such techniques to get more detail on individual decision and emerging behaviors? Well, this is a very difficult question. This week is the Integrated Assessment Modeling Consortium Conference. 
So I, I think the the place to ask this is to to the to this community. You no, know? I I don't know. What I can say is that big EAMs, uh, which have been developed for decades, uh, they have enormous inertia because they have put a lot of work there. And I know from people working in these institutions, know that the 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 general the core of the model, the main structural hypothesis, uh, this is not possible to change because then you will need to make a new model and then they continue developing the same model. So uh, in big EAMs, which are very, let's say, um, um, established, I see this type of structural changes more difficult. I think it's more probable new models. So thanks a lot, Inigo, it was great. Uh... You are Very welcome. Good. Thank you, everybody, for joining.